Okay, I think everyone's here. Yes, okay. Um, oh, but real quick, can we just agree on verbal POIs or? Okay, great. If there's anything else? No? Okay. If everyone's ready, my time starts now. Hello, judges, I'm sure I guess I'll be the first speaker on the affirmation side of this debate, strongly affirming the resolution that the United States federal government should implement a plan to create a na nationwide high-speed rail network. Our plan is the resolution, the actor and enforcer is the United States federal government, and the timeframe is January 2024, and the funding is $150 billion over the next five years. Uh, we're going to use the plan that is proposed by Amtrak, which includes 30 new routes, the 20 new trips on existing routes, and, uh, and service to 47 out of 48 contiguous states, and the project is slated to be completed by 2035. Our first advantage is on the environment. Uh, Wait, first, point of clarification? Um, yeah. Um, did you say 450 billion or 150 billion? I'm sorry. 150 billion. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, just to pile on that POC, would you mind putting that just in the chat, like for our ease possibly? Um, or like, could your partner do that or? Yeah, yeah, my partner could do that. Thank you. So the first advantage is on the environment. First uniqueness point, first point here is cars. So a typical passenger vehicle emits about 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. This assumes the average gasoline vehicle on the road has about 22 miles per gallon and drives around 11,500 miles per year. Transportation is additionally the US's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions at 27%. Our second uniqueness is on planes. According to UPenn Energy, rail is a cleaner transportation alternative to flights and has the lowest emissions per passenger mile ratio than any other means of transport. Our third uniqueness is on habitat loss. The Amtrak plan is merely connecting existing railroads under Amtrak's current system to be more unified and basically connect the entire nation. Railroads are being built next to highways and places of urban or suburban development, meaning that there's limited habitat invasion by railway development. Oh, right. Uh, sorry, I forgot to say real quick. Uh, weighing mechanism is not benefits. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, so there's the, there's not there's going to be very minimal habitat invasion because we're building these right next to areas of existing development. Uh, uniqueness four, which is about people's current preferences. According to the New York Post and also Fox News, uh, around 75% of people prefer long distance road trips over planes, trains, and other means of public transport. This is corroborated by many other sources as well. This is due to the inconvenience of the plane system and the lack of a national railway service. The fourth uniqueness is about oil. So both the pandemic and Russian sanctions are limiting oil supplies for the US across the country, causing increased gas prices for everyone in the status quo, and also likely with the oil shortages because we're running out of oil and it's a non-renewable resource, we'll, we will likely face these shortages in the future as well. So the link is the plan passes. First thing that happens is by 2035, there's a full national railway service provided by Amtrak's plans. Two, more people shift away from cars and planes towards the convenience of high-speed rail, meaning there's less CO2 emissions and overall fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Three, there's more ease on the oil crisis because the US is no longer dependent on these actors for oil. Uh, which also will drop our gas prices for those who do use cars for short form transportation if they really need to. Four, uh, there's less CO2 emission, which slows the rate of global warming, which also gives the US and the world more time to solve for climate change as we push back the timeline of irreversible damage. And of course, we all know climate change, you know, we, we all know what it is, but I'll just give a quick recap. Um, so we're currently, the pathway that the world is currently on, we are on track to eclipse the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold that scientists say will result in irreversible catastrophic damage, which includes sea level rise, mass habitat loss, and a sixth mass extinction. So it's very important to prevent climate change however we can. Um, so the impacts here are climate change and also the, which I just talked about, uh, to the economy, sea levels rising means that coastal infrastructure collapses. It's estimated that we will see the collapse of 24 airports and seaports in the US alone over the next 50 years if we don't do something. Three, biodiversity, ocean acidification and animal extinction uh, due to limited adaptability means a collapse in marine ecosystems and fish especially, which is a major food source for people all across the world. And also fourth impact, poverty. There's a prevention of larger and more frequent natural disasters. And also we protect people's homes. So people won't basically fall into poverty from natural disasters because there will be few natural disasters if there's less climate change. Okay, second advantage is on the economy. So our first uniqueness is about jobs. For every $1 billion that is spent on high-speed rail, there's 24,000 jobs created. 
and every $1 spent means that there's $4 of economic growth. And this also doesn't account for the peripheral jobs that will be created over time in the communities that are brought back to life due to high-speed rail. Two, fiscal feasibility. High-speed rail could also arguably pay for itself because land value would increase around the places that the projects were built. So if you live right next to a rail station, then your house value would go up. This alone could generate tens of billions of dollars in economic growth, even setting aside the other commercial benefits. Our third uniqueness is on traffic. Congestion on the roads costs $140 billion in lost time. And additionally, the US population is expected to grow by 100 million over the next four years. So building more highways would just be avoiding the inevitable. We should just shift, and it would just shift congestion somewhere else. We need a new system for this. Okay, uh, fourth uniqueness is on rural benefits. High-speed rail will make it easier for people from rural areas to travel into the city. It also makes it easier for people to commute into the city for work, say if they're commuting from a rural area. And also, again, increases property values around these stations. The fifth uniqueness is about safety. Riding commuter and intercity rail is about 30 times safer than driving in a car. So the link is the flight passes. And we have this high-speed rail network, internal link. So one, more people are able to commute for their jobs more easily and are able to expand their job searches to wider places. Two, there's less congestion on the roads, which saves everyone time and money. Three, economic growth is not just limited to these high-speed rail employees, but to the communities as well. So with this growth, people will be able to afford paying for tickets, thus ensuring that the project can make its money back. So basically high-speed rail is funding itself. And also you can look at the scenario where once someone is employed by high-speed rail, they now have more disposable income because they're earning a steady wage from uh, the government to, the government who is running this, and then they spend it on local business, which now also has more income. That business owner spends it on dance recitals for their child and so on. So there's this continuing cycle of economic growth here. So the impacts, oh, also safety. If people are more likely to trust high-speed rail, then they will use it, which means that fewer people will die in automobile accidents. So the impacts here are economy, because again, there's a lot of economic growth that's happening, not just as a result of high-speed rail, but also the periphery around it because when people have money they spend it and so it also helps the rest of the economy also quality of life people are spending less money stuck in traffic which means that they will have a better quality of life commuting to work and fifth is death because fewer people die if these uh, trains are safer than the cars that they usually use so for all these reasons we are just strong affirmation ballot thank you Okay, great speech. Uh, I'm going to be going down in just quick order. I'm just going to be doing off case, then duff case. If I'm speaking too fast, you can just say slow. If I'm being clear, you can say clear. POI is verbalized and established. Is anybody not ready? Okay, eight minutes. My time starts in three, two, one. The disadvantage number one is displacement. Our, our basically, our first point for this is housing prices rise. The February 8th to 28th poll of 33 property analysts suggested U.S. house prices would rise 10.3%. This was an upgrade from 8% in the December poll, suggesting underlying demand for housing is still strong and supply and house supplying is still tight. Why is this? HSR. It was found that HSR is going to be referred to as high-speed rail just just in the future. It was found that train stations with commuter trains in service have a mass volume of passengers more than the other stations due to the number of stops. Thus, the high number of passengers force high demand for property around the train stations, which lead to an increase in property prices. Why does matter? Well, the two point is that estimates inherently fail for the cost, right? In 1999, the 520 mile Los Angeles to San Francisco line was projected to cost $25 billion. The current projection is $80.3 billion. Even after adjusting for inflation, the even after adjusting for inflation, costs have more than doubled from a, a current, like from before HSR productions. Britain's 345 mile London to Scotland HS, um, HSR high speed rail line was originally projected to cost $32.7 billion euros and is currently expected to cost 106 billion euros right the, the three point here is that china also proves this in china over 2000 and 20, 2009 to 2017 they found a positive effect of hsr network accessibility on urban housing prices an increase in hsr network accessibility by one standard deviation caused about a 10.3 percent increase in average housing prices now you might be thinking this is good property values rising is good Here's why it's not. And the four point here is gentrification. One of the most important types of public investment that spurred gentrification is public transit. Neighborhoods near subways, 
light trails, buses, and other forms of mass transit attract affluent people in dense metros. And other forms of mass transit attract affluent people in, in like, this happens for two main reasons. First, it allows people to exchange long car commutes for shorter commutes on public transit, such as HSR. Second, it allows relatively affluent people to ditch their cars and fed and more money on rent, right? Empirical results suggest that the newly launched HSR services have induced industrial gentrification in the developed station area. Except for the displacement of agricultural production activities, HSR-induced industrial gentrification has not yet been manifested in the newly developed station area. Why is this important? Well, the impact is that gentrification is really bad. Gentrification is a powerful force for economic change in our cities, but it's often accompanied by extreme and un un unnecessary cultural displacement. While gentrification increases the value of properties and areas that suffer from prolonged disinvestment, it also results in rising rents, home, and property values. As these rising costs reduce the supply of affordable housing, existing residents who are often Black or Hispanic are displaced. This prevents them from benefiting from the economic growth. Gentrification also yeah. leads to negative impacts, I'll get to it at the bottom, impacts such as forced displacement, a fostering of discriminatory behavior by people in power, and a focus on spaces that exclude low-income individuals and people of color. Yes. So can you re-explain the link to housing prices with high-speed rail? Okay, so HSR essentially means that well, there's more affluent people traveling towards these dense areas since HSR travels from dense city to dense city. And what this means is that there is an increase in the property or in the property of like in these urban cities, right? This means that since there's an increase in property bones, this pushes out people who are existing residents who tend to be black and Hispanic. Yeah. This is bad because it displaces a lot of people. Like you guys say, like the uh, Gov says it in their own case, right? That housing prices inherently go up during HSR. This means that existing residents who are not as affluent get pushed out, which is really bad because it causes displacement of like people of color generally. The disadvantage, too, is cost, and it's just inherently unnecessary. The uniqueness for this is, number one, the current price for California's HSR project is $43 billion. And if you ask the rail authority, it's $66 billion, even when, and it's well over $100 billion when asking some estimates. The 17,000-mile, 220-mile-per-hour high-speed rail system proposed by the U.S. HSR will cost at least $2 trillion, which is far more than $150 billion that they put in their funding, proving that like this isn't going to make any sense to fund it for $150 billion you're going to run out of money by the time that you hit Montana when you start from California. Uh, the federal debt is also just incredibly high. The gross federal debt of the United States has surpassed $30 trillion. Additionally, this will carry far fewer people than promised. There are around 9 million annual trips north and south between LA and SF by flying, for example. And according to many sources, the rail authority acknowledges that they intend to take away passengers. We also have no idea how side government is going to be paying for this. We can assume that it's probably going to be in deficit spending, which, as I just said, is already over $30 trillion, which is just going to add to more national debt, even though it's probably not going to finish since they haven't allocated enough money. Oh. Europe has seen extensive growth of high-speed rail lines since 1990, yet the percentage of travel by rail has only grown slightly, and much of that growth has been in expensive intercity bus travel, not automobiles. Spain, for example, has more miles of high-speed rail lines than any other European country, yet rail travel has grown from 6.9% of surface travel in 1990 to 7.1% in that 2018, while bus travel declined from 14 0.9% to 8%. What does this mean? This means that that like that rail travel has actually gone down or has barely gone up. Up. Meanwhile, air travel within Europe is growing at 10% a year. So really what we see is that it, like when you in, implement high-speed rail, trail like trains don't even get that much many more passengers. It's in fact air which gets far more. Okay, what are the links here? HSR only increases debt and the cost of HSR is outrageous. Current estimates for California's HSR system come at $880 billion, which is just absurd. And I'm trying to do that for the entire East Coast. That's not going to make any sense. Also, precedent proves, as I've told you, a lot of like a lot of East a lot of like uh, European countries have tried this and they simply had racked up enormous amounts of debt. China is now losing $24 million per day with a reported debt of $1.8 trillion due to high-speed rail. The dissent number three is environment. Right now, the California HSR project, for example, is expected to cave out numerous tunnels and mountains, which is going to be detrimental to the environment and to numerous ecosystems. There are far quicker, more cost-effective ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions than high-speed rail. By the time high-speed rail projects commence service, more cars will be fully electric, so future high-speed 
high-speed rail systems would be replacing fewer gasoline-powered automobile trips than they would be replacing a decade ago, right? Building high-speed rail systems requires steel and concrete, the manufacturing of which typically generates greenhouse gases. Trucks, bulldozers, and other construction site equipment also consume energy, thus during their long construction phases, high-speed rail projects add greenhouse gases. Now, going on to their case really quickly, let's look at this, and we can actually cross by a lot of the warrants here. First up on the first one, an environment, literally just cross by our, envi our entire environment is that damage where we essentially tell you that the concrete and steel manufacturing to build this high-speed rail probably counteracts a lot of the environmental benefits that you get from it. Even if you do buy that there's environmental benefits, you're likely not going to be able to finish the railroad with this much money allotted. And even if you can, you're not going to be getting that many more people using it, as we've seen that air travel actually increases rather than these cars. Additionally, they talk about like oil shortages. We want to tell you is like, this is like really not like a direct impact here because the United States purchases oil and uses oil, not really for trains necessarily, but more so for like cars and these other things by the fact that it's like bus travel and car travel doesn't really diminish that much with high-speed rail, so they don't get access to the impacts that they talk about on how this gets, like, done. They say habitat loss. Again, they don't give you any reasons why this, like, doesn't happen. On the oil shortages point, literally turn this, you need oil to build these highway rails, so by the fact that there's still going to be oil necessary. They talk about how that's going to create a lot of jobs and how it's going to be, like, stimulate the economy, but these jobs are probably going to be pretty unsafe as they're, like, dealing with a lot of, like, materials which are, like, really bad for humans to ingest and they're likely not going to be paid much as you only allocate $150 billion to this, even though it's going to cost well over a trillion, meaning it's likely not going to work this way. Judge, for the simple reason, it's just not feasible to build a high-speed rail with this little amount of money and to expect all the great benefits, even though high-speed rail is pretty bad in and of itself. I urge a strong ballot for signed opposition. Thank you. Okay. Um, the order of the speech will be um, the negative case, just top down, and then the affirmative case, top down. Um, is everybody ready? Actually, I'm going to keep my camera off because my bandwidth has been pretty bad for the past two days, and I don't want to cut out. That's fine with everybody. Cool. <clears throat> okay. Um, my eight minutes starts in three, two, one. Here are three main responses to the negative case. First, we're not doing this in the next year. It's a gradual change over 12 years. Second, our increased economic growth warrants still stand, and that means that people are going to be able to afford homes. And third, the first the first advantage is probably entirely unique, non-unique. So let's get into it. So on the first is advantage of dis displacement, right? They tell you that high-speed high rail um, is going to cause urban, like prices in urban cities to go up, but this is non-unique. Places, places with high-speed rail stations are going to be in urban areas, right? Property values in those urban areas are already rising. Those places are already very popular for people to live in, and those prices are already increasing. High-speed rail is not going to uniquely cause this problem. Prices are already expensive in urban areas like Manhattan and California, right? And because they say these prices are only going to be rising in urban cities, we say this is not unique because prices are already rising in these cities already, right? Affordable, affordable housing is probably a problem in the United States, but there's no real reason for why the affirmative is making this problem worse. And there's no, like, like, there's no way for you guys to solve for that problem either. Right. On their arguments about how California's train cost is going to be very high, we see that California has a unique problem as California has a very strong imminent domain law, and i.e. homeowners can very easily stop the state from taking their land even for no reason at all. This is not going to be a problem for the rest of the country. The UK example that they give is also different because there's different terrain and different laws, so we can't look at that as an example for why our specific uh, like plan is going to cost a lot of money. Um, on the impact level, they talk about, or sorry, on the gentrification arguments, we would say that high-speed rail would help poor people who aren't able to afford higher prices of gas and cars because they're going to be able to afford cheaper cheaper forms of transit, right? So, like, the affirmative plan is going to solve for these, like, poor people who are, like, already being displaced in the status quo, which means, first, firstly, this is not unique. But second, we're saying that the affirmative plan actually attempts to solve this problem because we're helping poor people in the trans, like, getting, getting like, cheaper transit um, because we say that gas prices are too high right now. Um, on the impact layer, they talk about how high-speed rails are accompanied by unnecessary cultural displacement, basically gentrification, which causes rising rents and drops in affordable housing. Cities already have public transport that goes to them, i.e. BART, like in, like BART in Bay Area, goes from other cities to San Francisco, so this is non-unique. If anything, we help lower gentrification because we have stations all across the United States. Um, on the second disadvantage, um, they talk about how the California project is going to be like $2 trillion. We can classify the earlier California warrant. Um, on the second uniqueness about debt, they talk a lot about debt and why debt, why like our plan is going to increase the debt. But we would say that we should invest 
we should invest this money because it's going to promise 24,000 jobs for $1 billion, right? Um, look, to, look at the analysis my partner gives you on the second advantage, where we tell you that every $1 billion spent on high-speed rail is going to like turn over to 24,000 jobs, and every $1 spent is $4 of economic growth. This specific warranting isn't actually touched by the negative, which means you can cross apply this here. We're telling you that this is going to pay back itself, which means that this short-term debt problem that they're talking about, we're going to solve for. And second, they don't really give you a reason for why this accumulation of debt is a bad thing. Why does it matter if the United States accumulates a little bit, a little bit more debt, right? The United States already has $30 trillion in debt. If we're putting like an extra $150 billion in debt, they don't give you a specific reason for why that's a bad thing. Right. Um, on the on the arguments about how like Europe's percentage of travel has like not increased that much, we tell you that they give you warrants from Europe, which already has some forms of large scale public transport, which means that these like other forms of public transport are already existent and are being used by the people. So it's not like it's not the same problem that we're trying to solve. The problem we're trying to solve in the United States is the overusage of cars and the overusage of planes, right? And in the U in Europe, we said that there's a lot more alternative alternative transport systems that already exist that people use as opposed to cars um, to go from country to country or from state like state to state, right? So we tell you that this is a complete, completely different example. The United States has to solve a uniquely different problem. And we tell you, we do one specifically for the United States. Um, just a minute, I'm getting to the bottom of the case after after the bottom of the negative. Um, so on the link on the link level, we tell you that this 30 trillion, this like increase in debt doesn't really matter. Um, because they don't give you a warrant for why it does. And we already have 30 trillion in debt. We're telling you that our plan is going to be passed after the debt ceiling rises. So we're not going to have any problems here. And on the argument about how we're going to run out of money, we say that your like your examples of warranting for why we're going to run out of money just don't work because the situation is different from any other situation that you give us. And we tell you that this project is going to pay back for itself, which means if if there is a possibility that they, this plan runs out of warrant, uh, of money, we would say that in the future, like we probably, we, like we, we probably like the United States federal government would probably allocate even more budget for this. On the third advantage of on the third disadvantage of the environment, they talk about how there's better ways in high speed rail and more cars will be fully electric. And this we tell you that this means that more highways are built in the negative world because you need more highways to connect the country um, or like to connect people, right? And the specific thing that you're gonna have is you're gonna have more electric charging stations, right? Because it cost because you can't cross California to the Midwest going through the Rocky Mountains without thousands and thousands and thousands of electric charge stations, right? That's more that's more development that's happening on its habitat. You're so just turn this argument, right? In the negative world, you are perfect, you are causing more habitat loss because you are building these state building these electric um charging stations like infinitesimally more, infinite, infinitely more than we are building like rail rail railway systems, right? So you don't solve either. And in addition, electrifying a single system of transport is much easier than convincing millions and millions of people to switch to electric cars. So essentially, we, we're, we're solving for climate change here, right? There's no warrant for why um, people are going to pre prefer um, electric power cars in the next 10 years as opposed to gas cars. There's just not enough warranting done by the opposition for them to get access to the, any, any of these arguments. And I also talk about like oil and um, actually, I'll just do that on the affirmative. Um, your POI. Don't worry about it. Okay, cool. Um, moving on to the affirmative case. So starting on the first advantage of the environment, right? They tell you that there's no link for this habitat loss argument to happen. We're telling you that we're not gonna cause habitat loss because we're building railway systems next to highways, right? And like, um, because these railroads are being built to places, built next to places of urban and suburban development, that means that these there's gonna be limited habitat invasion by railway development in the first place, right? And we also continue to give you these warrants about how 75% of people in the United States prefer long distance road trips over other means of public transport. And essentially everybody in the United States uses cars. That is the problem that we're trying to solve. And there's been there's not been a situation in the past of another country trying to solve that specific problem, which means any warranting that they give you is probably not true to, not comparable to the United States. This warranting still stands with how people are gonna go towards uh, high-speed rail in the United States specifically. On the arguments of oil, they tell you that this is not a direct impact. Bus and, bus and car travel doesn't necessarily diminish. Um, most Americans agree that trains are better than cars and long term, and they, they try to turn this argument by saying you need oil for rail. In the long term, we're going to need less oil because we're just going to need this oil to like build the trains. And like we would say that these these like one time national like these trains that are going across the country are probably going to take up less oil than the thousand millions and millions and millions of cars that already use this oil. We tell you that cars are more dirtier than than like trains on average, which means like on a on a like a on a comparison basis, we are probably solving better for the environment. So you can be extending our impact to climate change, the economy and poverty. Um, on the second argument of economy, they said that we're not gonna be able to pay for this and we don't have enough funding. We're citing a plan 
written by top government officials by Amtrak, and we're giving you the exact funding amount that Amtrak has proposed, which means that if Amtrak, the specific company that's proposing it, is able to make an accurate prediction, that means we're gonna not probably not going to run out of money, right? So you can continue to extend the arguments about traffic being reduced, rural benefits being improved, safety being improved. All these links still flow through. You can flow through the, specifically the link scenario of rural communities getting an econ economic boost because um, with this growth, people are able to afford paying for high-speed rail tickets, and like their their specific um, economic status is going to improve because their the property values around them. Like their, it's going to be their homes whose property values are rising, which means they're going to make, they're going to be um, more economically developed, right? So overall, you can be extending all of our link chains because they don't really touch any of our link chains, right? You can extend why we're going to specifically be reducing global warming. You can extend why, specifically why we're improving the economy and why this plan solves that for itself. Any of their arguments are just defensive or non-unique. This is why you vote for affirmative. All right. Can everyone hear me? Great. I have eight minutes. Oh, let me just silence this. All right. Um, eight minutes. I'll start on. I'll start on the gov case, and then I'll head over to the op case. Yeah. Okay. Time starts in three, two, one. I just want to start on the top of case here where my opponents basically get caught in a trap. And the first response of the member of the of the government side on the argument that we tell you in which we say that there's not enough funding for this project and they have basically no mechanism for funding is essentially to just rapidly shift stands and shift the, shift the position of the government case in which the member of the government basically says, if we need more funding, the USFG can always give us more funding and says that, you know, the estimates are wrong because California is a different scenario. Two quick counters to this, and this is basically just going to undermine the entire government case within today to bear on, because the government is advocating for a plan, and if they don't have you know proper funding for this plan, and if they don't even have you know a proper mechanism for making this plan to happen, you're basically undermining every impact impact they have in this debate around. Firstly, we give you national warrants, which basically tell you that a national system would require nearly two trillion dollars. But even on the California point, at the California point, on the low end is going to cost around you know. 50 to $100 billion. That's just California. You have to extend that to a national system. There are a bunch more issues involved in that. But then they also have absolutely no mechanism for making this happen. This means that you're going to lead to deficit spending. There are two main impacts that come out of this. First, waste of political capital. Political leaders are going to have to use political capital in order to warrant more deficit spending because it's so controversial. This is going to make it in the future much more difficult for political leaders to advocate for other spending things, things on health care, things on helping people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. It becomes much more hard to justify that because you're justifying deficit spending. But the second thing here is that in order to make up for deficit spending, opposing parties that want to cut down on deficit spending always tend to increase taxes on poor individuals, on people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So it ends up hurting them in the end, which means that deficit spending is inherently going to be bad. But even furthermore, you know, just spending in debt is always going to end up increasing panic regarding, uh, uh, regarding the U.S. economy, even if it's not going to lead to actual tangible harms, we already see today that there's major panic in the economy over U.S. deficit spending, which was going to lead to more economic harms in the future. Going down the opposition, case, uh, the government case, their first argument that they basically give here is on the environment, right? They say that cars emit a bunch and that's going to be really problematic. There are a few big counters that we have on this. First, they blatantly ignore this, the examples that we give you, which, which is that around Europe, what we end up seeing is that plane usage increases and bus usage and car usage ends up basically decreasing. Car usage actually increases a little bit within Europe. So what we see is that they basically have no response to the fact that plane usage, because of the fact that plane corporations are so successful in reducing the fares and, and increasing the accessibility of planes to individuals, it makes it so easy for people to actually end up using planes that people aren't going to use the high-speed rail system. They try and say that, you know, Europe has more public transit, so people are going to use public transit. Yes, less. But in the United States, what we end up seeing is that, firstly, there are public transit systems that allow people to get from place to place. They allow people to get to places nationally. So that argument still stands. But what we further see is this doesn't even address the fact that people are still increasing in the amount of plane usage. But they also ignore the argument that they give. They completely concede the argument 
investment, that because you're putting in so much investment, this isn't going to be super accessible to people because prices are going to be so high to pay off the amount of money that was spent on this, which means that just like it is in China, high-speed rail systems are typically a premium luxury, which means that people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds typically aren't able to use high-speed rail systems, which means it's not accessible, which means you're not helping people from rural backgrounds, which means you're not actually getting people out of cars, and which means that you're not going to be able to address the issues that we see in the world today. But continuing on, continuing on the environment issue, we give you the argument that you know, you're know you going to lead to habitat loss and eminent domain. Now, they say you're building next to the highway, so this doesn't matter. But even if you're building next to a highway, that still means that, they're going to be, that, that there's going to be eminent domain, especially considering the government just controls the highway system. But if you're building next to the highway, you're going to now have to take over that area. And considering that you know high people that live next to highways typically end up living in like lower, like li living in lower socio socioeconomic backgrounds because those are like less, like less wanted spots to live in next to a highway. You're going to lead to eminent domain that's going to end up hurting people from lower socio socioeconomic backgrounds. But even more on that, you're still contributing to habitat loss because in order to make the railway, you're going to have to mine for materials, mine for things like that, which increases fossil fuel usage. Even further, much of the electricity that's actually generated for electric high speed rails is from fossil fuels. So that even is not even addressed by my opponents. But even building on that, what we end up seeing is that um you oftentimes are going to need to basically mine for materials, bring that in from other countries, which undermines their economy point, which only further means that when we're looking at these short-term impacts, because short-term impacts on environment have to be valued here because we have so little time to address climate change, my opponents are leading to a much worse world. Meanwhile, when you look to the opposition world, we see a world where there are more, you know, electric cars coming into play. Now they try and do this crazy comparison in which they say that, you know, like building energy stations is worse off. This doesn't actually make any sense, especially because, you know, it's much cheaper for private companies to just build charging stations around the United States rather than building out this massive project that's just not going to do anything to solve the harms that we see. Going further down the opposition case, they basically end up saying that on the economy point, you're going to end up building, you're going to end up getting a bunch of jobs and things like that. But a few things here. Firstly, I mean, even if you're able to get like 25,000 jobs creating, this ignores the massive effects that eminent domain and the taxing system can have on individuals. But even more than that, these aren't long-term jobs necessarily. But even building on that, what we end up seeing is that you can flow through the link scenario that we give here, which basically tells you that because of debt increases and things like that, you're actually not going to be able to get so much of the economic impacts. And because of the increases in debt and the fact that, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of countries around the world have not seen economic increases because of high speed rail, there's just literally no warranting to tell you that the high speed rail is going to like generate a bunch of money for people. But even further on that, because economic, because airline companies and things like that are lowering their costs and energy and, and car companies are making their cars more energy efficient. What we end up seeing is that this project probably isn't going to lead to any long-term change. People are just not that likely to end up using the high speed rail. It hasn't been done in the past. And it's probably not going to end up happening in the future. But they also ignore the fact that you're going to have to have secondary building of this as well. And this goes to the rural point because they literally just leave pe people that live in rural areas in the dust. Because if you're building a highway on highway systems, highway systems aren't able to access every person, which means that once again, you're not able to reach out to these people. Furthermore, Going on their argument that like you're reducing congestion on the roads, we basically tell you that like people aren't switching from their cars, especially because people typically are using their cars to get to places that they otherwise wouldn't be able to get to on things like public transit, right? And so that means that there's no way that like the highways that that a high speed rail system is effectively going to get people to the places that they need to. And considering that it's going to take a while to build the high speed rail system, that's just not something that we're going to end up seeing. And now, you know, going back to the government, uh, to the opposition case, I think that like they can see the most of the stuff that they, they can see the surprising amount of stuff that we say here, especially on the fact of like cost. And also, you know, looking at our first argument, which tells you about the displacement, like they completely ignore the fact that not only are these projects like leading to gentrification, gentrification, which is a complete turn on their properties values going up argument, it's going to end up hurting a lot of people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. But we also see that these projects are incredibly corrupt. In China, in Spain, in a bunch of areas, there was massive corruption associated with the railway with the railway system. And what that means is that like we don't even know what we're going to be getting out of this. They don't have enough funding. And what we also end up seeing is that on this point that it's non-unique, right? Like 
if you're building a high speed rail system, that's only going to increase the impacts. Even if there are some in impacts of gentrification, you're only increasing them through the high speed rail system. So they essentially can see the argument that they, that we give you. And so considering that there's already solutions being put forth towards environment and because high speed rail is not a long term solution to the environmental issues that we see around the United States, it is not worth the project because you're increasing debt, increasing environmental harm and increasing gentrification and displacement. Thank you. Okay, so four minutes speech, really quick off time. I'm just gonna be doing just some like final touch on the on both on and off case before going into three voting issues in this debate round and some stops and just impacting out all the points telling whether this is a clear um op out. Is anybody not ready? Okay, my time starts in three, two, one. Judge, we tell you that it costs nearly two trillion dollars to spend on an, an an entire national rail system, which gets dropped by side government. And this one is extremely important because it allows off to access the entire link chain. They aren't going to be able to access any of their impacts. They don't have enough money to build the rail in the first place. Even if you don't buy that as an individual reason to vote for op, but that they never access the rewards for a few reasons, they never get their money back. Right? They talk about all these impacts, which rely on the fact that you're going to be making money in the long term. Yeah, we tell you you're never making your money back. Look at our warrants on China. We tell you that it costs $24 million a day just because of China built high-speed rail and never not access to any, any of the economic impacts. You never get the money back. You never see the economic stimulation that side government wants you to believe. Additionally, even if you buy it, there's going to be somewhat of a, like, a net economic growth by the fact that this completely gets counteracted by the fact that there's gentrification within the urban cities. And you see that like there's just a huge takeover of like the rich and the affluent within these urban cities, which just completely undermines the amount of like which completely undermines like any economic impacts that you get on the long term. What are you going to be weighing down to on the side opposition case? Really, there's three things. There's the economics, environment, and there's just like a gentrification argument. First up, let's go on gentrification, which is like the displacement argument. We basically tell you here is that they say this point is not unique. Yet this just doesn't make any sense. And, and it roots in like a core misunderstanding of what the gentrification point is. Inside government world, there, it, we agree. There is somewhat gentrification within urban cities already. However, in an op world, there is an increase increasingly more gentrification. Why is gentrification bad? Well, we literally tell you this within the first argument because they try to tell you we don't tell you why, right? We literally tell you that like this is the cultural displacement. It means that like culture is lost within the cities. This is inherently a bad thing because it means that like history is forgotten about and that's just like a really bad thing. In addition to the fact that now millions of people of color are not able to live within cities and are without a home, right? This is inherently bad. This is an independent reason why to vote for side opposition. Even if you don't buy this, buy like the, go to like the fact on like economics, right? Where we basically tell you that this is like a masses and a more debt and it means like there's an infinite corruption pit. They said that there's no impact to like the debt argument. Yeah, we literally tell you that there's not going to be any like that you're never going to be able to reach any the economic impacts, the environmental impacts for users if they're not able to buy this. Additionally, we tell you that people are just not going to be able to access this high-speed rail because of what we call like the premium in the sense that it costs so much money to put in high-speed rail that the cost of a ticket is going to be absurdly high, meaning only affluent people are going to get access to like the really fast connections that they're only going to be able to go to the urban cities and they're going to be able to gentrify the cities. By the fact that people aren't going to be able to use this, therefore people continue to use the cars. So all of their analysis on like how people are going to not use cars and there's going to be like no habitat loss don't buy this because people are still going to use cars they say the european example doesn't make sense because europe has like alternate transportation streams but the fact that we have that as well in the united states and the fact that they don't tell you where the disconnect is Okay, third here, right? The third thing is really big. It's the environment. And we think that's what, what side government is going to like weigh down to. Two reasons why you're not going to be buying this. First of all, we tell you an environment is pretty simple, right? We tell you that like the cost to build it and like the amount of like materials to build it is really bad. And we think that because the funding is not specified and they try to shift sands within the MG, you should buy the fact that they're still going to be sticking this 150 billion over 12 years. And because they're not going to be able to fully build it, they're going to be manufacturing lots of steel and concrete, which is going to emit a lot of greenhouse gases and they're never going to be able to get the environmental impacts that they talk about even if you don't buy this point by the fact that like oil dependency is still high therefore it's not unique this point goes pretty much dropped by the mg and by the fact that like any job created we tell you that like the cost and maintenance of it is going to be extremely bad and it's going to mean that even if you're going to get environmental outcomes in the future you're still going to have to spend greenhouse gases for cost and maintenance for transit for to keep up operational costs those are three independent analysis to buy you're going to be voting for opposition we understand that side government 
government is going to try and go for any environment or like job impacts, you simply buy the flat, like gut check it, right? Even if jobs are created in the short term, they're going to be really bad in the long term because A, they're minor and B, it's going to lead to increased gentrification, which we think literally just outweighs here. And our environment, we tell you that they're never going to be able to build it. Therefore, they don't get access to any of the economic jobs isn't even unique because we build jobs within like our world. There's jobs within like transportation or like, um, like, like rail system. So for these reasons, strong vote for side opposition by the fact that like even like probability and vote off of probability. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Optician. Um, a quick off track wrap up. I'll just be going over some of the new arguments that were made by the second opposition speaker. Uh, first, on AF and the NEG, and then on to uh, some weighing of the NEG. Okay, so my time starts now. Hello, Josh, I'm Shreya Gosavi, the third speaker for the affirmations of this debate, strongly affirming the resolution. So just a quick reminder, these are all golden terms because these arguments were made in the second speech, so we're allowed to respond to them now. First, they say um, on the debt ceiling, on the framework, they say the government is, that we're advocating for a plan that if we don't have an appropriate mechanism, then, then we have no impact. Okay. So this basically applies to everything though. We're using Amtrak, which again is the one that's the expert here. They're the, they're the ones that have the existing rail networks. And we say, it, my partner says in his speech, that the Amtrak warrant is the one to be preferred because they're the ones who've done the most projections regarding a high-speed rail system. They've been doing this for many, many years. So they prefer the government warrant saying that we can do this because you know, like we're, we're citing an expert here. So you can basically flow through our impact. And secondly, they ignore the reason why we dismissed the California warrant, which is eminent domain laws. Again, Joe, they say like, oh, California costs a bunch of money. Yes. That is because of a unique law in California called eminent domain, where people can basically refuse to give up their property for any reason at all. And the state has to give them inordinate amounts of money in order to get them to give up their property. This is mostly wealthy people are doing this because they see that they can get money out of the state. So this logic is basically inapp inapp inapplicable to any other state because no other state has laws like this. Secondly, they say there's no mechanism for making this happen. They talk about deficit spending. We've been using deficit spending forever and there's no economic collapse that's happening. Also, the panic that they cite is not due to deficit spending. It's due to a couple of private banks failing, which is completely unrelated to deficit spending. So don't buy this warrant about people panicking about deficit spending. It's just not happening. Okay, they, they talk a lot about how we ignore their examples. Again, Europe is not a good example because they already have large scale public transport. We have no nationwide cheap, reliable transport system, which we, we also said, okay. They'll talk about how uh, rural areas are being basically left to the side here. Again, I said my first speech, we would connect rural systems too. And also rural people, people living in rural areas can still hop onto uh, the train at different uh, stations. That's how trains work. Okay, they also say we cause habitat loss. Again, the thing that negation ignores is, is in my first speech, I said the population is going to increase, which means if we don't do high-speed rail, we're going to have to build more highways. So that means that they're going to be building more electric vehicle charges and highways anyway, which have a larger land footprint. So you can't avoid the congestion, it's going to happen either way, or we're losing $140 billion a year, which, which you might observe is how much our plan costs in the first place. Okay, let's talk about how there's fossil fuel usage. Uh, turn, again, my partner already mentioned this, so you can just slow this through. Electrifying a million cars is much more difficult than electrifying one high-speed rail system. So you're just going to, go, going to be buying the fact that we're solving for climate change because it's much easier for the government to just mandate that we're electrifying a high-speed rail system than convincing like tens of millions of people to electrify their cars. This is obviously true, just common sense. Okay, um, short-term impacts. Okay, so again, uh, we're increasing. So in, again, in the negation world, there's going to be inevitably more highways built, which means they also are losing on this level where we're actually solving climate change because again, electrifying high-speed rail is much easier than convincing tens of millions of people to do this. Okay, they also talk about how we're ignoring the massive impacts of, uh, on the second convention. They talk about how we're ignoring the massive impacts of eminent domain. Again, people get paid for this. And also they never tell you why eminent domain is bad besides a vague, it harms low-income communities, which again, they also do. You can look to our warranty that climate change harms poorer people the most. Um, okay, they talk about rural areas, I already mentioned that. And so basically you're gonna be seeing that you can flow through this entire link scenario of economic growth because they never actually respond to the fact that there are going to be jobs made. They tell you, oh, these are bad short-term jobs, but they never tell you why. They just say like, oh, they're going to be bad for some reason that's not really given. So you can just blow through this link scenario of rural communities getting a boost. And this is unique to the affirmation because we're the only side that's actually doing anything to help these rural communities out. Again, if people have money, they will spend it. And so this will continue into a cycle of uh, prosperity. Again, $1 spent on high-speed rail means $4 of economic. Okay, briefly into the next case, they talk again about gentrification. Uh, they ignore, again, they ignore a point that high-speed rail helps poor people, so you can just turn this. They also give examples of China and Russia, which are known to be corrupt with their finances. The US is not one of these nations. And also we're citing a figure from Amtrak, so like it's not a government thing, it's a private company. 
Um, secondly, they say that, oh, there are already some projects at work. At the point where they tell you there's exactly, like, they don't tell you the details of any of these projects, we can't be expected to defend against every possible solution to this massive problem. You can just basically ignore this point about how there's projects at work because they, they give you no details for those. Okay. So here are basically three reasons that you're going to be voting for the affirmation here. One, the economic growth link scenario. This basically goes unrefuted, the actual link scenario itself. We do have the high-speed rail will be paying for itself. They don't refute this. Again, $140 billion lost in uh, due to congestion per year that the negation is not solving for, the affirmation is. So we tell you that the economy is going to be boosted because of this. Two, climate change. Again, in the, neg in the negation world, people have no option for uh, cheap, reliable transport. We tell you highways will increase in the negation. Again, you can look to our second contention for this. So this is offense for us. Highways are far worse than trains because they shift congestion and are worse environmentally. Three, the gentrification turn. Poor people are living in cities right now are not able to travel due to high car prices. High-speed rail helps them while negation keeps them tra trapped in concrete jungles. The main thing that the negation is going to probably collapse to is they give uh, its cost. So they give zero reasons for why deficit spending is actually bad that has a link. They talk about how it's difficult to justify other political spending. But again, $150 billion added to $30 trillion in debt doesn't cause a harder justification. Let's talk about the environment. Habitat loss is non-unique. And also, again, they're going to be building more highways in their world. We saw for long-term travel. Gentrification, I already talked about that, is non-unique, uh, worst and uh, best is offense for the affirmation. So for all these reasons, I urge a strong affirmative ballot. Thank you. Good debate, everyone. Great debate. Thank you. Thank you. Good debate. Okay, so should we all submit our ballots and then, I don't know, are the other judges, do you guys disclose? Yeah, I mean, I'm fine with that. Okay, and then I also wanted to know, um, or just wanted to say, um, Joel Jacobs is reporting this round, um, but because he wasn't able to ask the competitors beforehand, he said that if any of you guys weren't okay with that, um, he'll delete it as soon as he returns to his computer after the round. Um, so if anybody is not okay with it being recorded, um, just put it in the chat. Um, someone someone will let him know. <laughs>